At this presentation, we'll hear from Max Harms about transhumanism, an ideology that takes humanist ideals and combines them with an attention to disruptive new technologies. How can attention to transforming and improving the human condition lead us to an inspiring vision of a better tomorrow? Max Harms is the author, software engineer, mathematician, and leader in the rationality community. For many years, he's been foundational in inspiring and helping people in Ohio be better skeptics, emotional thinkers, and communicators. He runs a rationality practice group at rationalitydojo.com and is engaged this year in catalyzing an improvement to how critical thinkers engage politically. Max is also a student of artificial intelligence, cognitive science, and philosophy. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Max Harms. Thank you, Rose. Uh, and hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, I am processing a cold, so please forgive me if I'm a little bit uh, more muted than my usual exuberant self. So I'm here today to talk to you all about transhumanism. And specifically, I want to talk about the paradigm of transhumanism. A paradigm is how we see the world, how we automatically respond to it, the sort of framing or outlook that we can take. Consider, as an example paradigm, the paradigm of atheism. On its surface, atheism is about belief, or non-belief, in uh, God or gods. Right? It's a, a thing that is about what we deliberately think, what we, uh, how our beliefs are. But not all atheists think the same way. And there's a difference between having the atheist uh, beliefs and an atheist paradigm. To illustrate, I'll use an example of, uh, let's say, someone named Dan. Let's say that Dan was raised in a uh, Christian household. Let's say he was raised Catholic. And as such, he was imbued from a young age with a certain paradigm, a Catholic paradigm, that said that, for example, uh, sex before marriage was sinful or immoral, and that homosexuality was deviant and wrong. And let's say that Dan was gay. And so, in his experience of the world, he had a deep sense of shame, of not being good enough according to the standard that he saw. Even if he didn't have this as a deliberate belief, the paradigm, the way of seeing the world, made this the way that he experienced things how his emotions reacted. Imagine that Dan goes to college, and finally he has some distance from his family and from his background, and he has the space to come to know himself better. Let's say that he takes a philosophy class, or finally just uh, reaches out sexually or romantically. Um, maybe he it's a boyfriend who is an atheist. And slowly, or perhaps all at once, he updates, he changes his mind, and adopts an atheistic belief. So this is good. He has the belief that allows him to uh, see himself as right and good, no better or worse than other people. But he hasn't necessarily adopted the atheist paradigm yet, just because he's adopted that belief set. For example, he may still feel an automatic sense of shame or not being good enough in how he engages uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. He may feel like there's a God watching him, or it may seem like things are happening for a reason, just as part of how he sees the world. He might still have this Christian paradigm. Let's say that while in college, Dan contracts HIV. His paradigm, this paradigm of theism, says that this happened for a reason, and that it is a punishment from on high. To break out of this perspective, we need to not just, as thinkers, adopt different belief sets, but learn to see the world in a different way. I, uh, as 
was mentioned, I'm a student of the mind. Um, and in my exploration into rationality and um, psychology and cognitive science, um, my perspective, I've come to the perspective that we act uh, with different levels of belief. There are surface beliefs that we have, deliberate beliefs, things we espouse or say to others. And then there are the beliefs that guide our um, immediate reactions, our paradigms. And it's possible to adopt the atheist belief set without fully adopting that paradigm. And there's value in adopting that paradigm. That paradigm is what allows us to, let's say that Dan uh, sees people suffering in the world. Let's say that he decides to go into uh, psychiatry because he sees a number of people who are suffering with mental illness. Maybe he himself uh, has some experiences with this. He, uh, he might be depressed occasionally, or might have a, an eating disorder. He might be overweight. These things are very common. And so he wants to do something about it. He wants to help people. And so he reaches out to them. And from a certain perspective, you can look at the world and you can see such great suffering. And there's a question of why. Why do we suffer like this? Why are people born into minds and bodies and contexts where suffering is just the natural state and there is very little hope of escape or anything better? But this question of why is part of that same paradigm that a lot of us find naturally when we're young, either because it was given to us or because it seems right, that things are set up by some sort of planner or creator. And that's just not true. I'm an atheist. I hold an atheist paradigm. And when I look at the world, I don't see this question of why. I simply see people suffering because of that context. Because there's no rule that says that things must be good. Now, that doesn't mean that things have to be bad. A lot of people, when they come across the atheist paradigm at first, or atheist belief sets, have a sense of despair. They have a sense that this is a nihilistic, bleak perspective, that the world is a cold and dark place. And this is kind of true. The world is a cold, dark, bleak place. There is no hand that has set things up to be light and good and right and just. Except that there are humans. Humans took over the planet. And now we no longer live in a world that is quite as dark. I feel a sense of hope and lightness when I look out in the world, because I see the ways in which humans, not some god from above, have brought righteousness and goodness, beauty and joy and fairness into the world. We can imagine Dan adopting this perspective and seeing himself bringing joy and compassion to the world in his work and how he might become engaged civically in helping the human condition grow and flourish towards pushing light into the world and making it a better place. This is fundamentally important. And I think that it's fundamentally human. We seek to make a better world every day, right? For ourselves, for others, through our compassion, through our work. It's human to push beyond that which we're given. To say, all right, I see this bleak world that doesn't have any intrinsic purpose or uh, that isn't naturally safe, but I'm going to make it better. And we make it better in many ways. We make it better through compassion and through community. And we make it better through maintenance work, through cleaning our bathtubs, through uh, paving roads. And we make it better through invention and through cultural discovery, 
through creating great works of art. The aspect of invention and technology is part of the human condition. I talked about the atheist paradigm. I see this as fundamental. It's one of the building blocks to the transhumanist paradigm. The other fundamental building block, the other fundamental way of seeing the world, is of seeing humans as fundamentally technological creatures. In a certain sense, we are all cyborgs. And that might seem a little bit weird at first. It's something like science fiction. When we hear the word cyborg, we might think of someone who has half their body made out of machines, that uh, they're like Robocop or the Six Million Dollar Man or something like that. They might have you know, extendo arms or something along those lines. But a cyborg is just an organism, a being that has technology fundamentally a part of themselves. Technology becomes an extension of the organism, such that that line is blurred. And without technology, they could not survive. And this describes humanity. Humanity has been shaped by technology. It's built into us. It's in our DNA. It's in our bodies. Let's forget Dan for a moment, set him aside, and let's rewind the clock to the ancient, ancient past, to Africa, far, far ago. And once upon a time, there was a person in Africa who discovered a technology, who made an invention, which fundamentally would change the planet and would let their descendants succeed in a fundamental way and grow to become better creatures, more filled with capacity and light and awareness. This was the first killer app, the first groundbreaking technology. And it changed us, it made us who we are today. Can anyone tell me what this most fundamental technology was, this first fire. important technology? Fire. Fire, exactly. It's the campfire. <coughs> it's cooking. With cooking, with the ability to harness fire, we can unlock more, more nutrients in our food than would otherwise be available. We can, uh, it suddenly was no longer the case that our brains could only be so big. The brain is a very, very costly organ to create and uh, to run. Children, when growing up, um, their brains and their bodies grow alternately because there's not enough nutrition to actually grow both at the same time. The, uh, the advent of fire, of the ability to create fires and control fires, allowed for cooking allowed for more nutrition, and it changed our bodies. We have shorter intestines, we have smaller teeth, we have vestigial teeth that aren't good anymore, right? Because we don't need them. We're not chewing on tubers uh, all, all day. We've outsourced our digestion into technology. We've said, all right, here is an external thing. I'm going to make that an extension of my being, and I rely on it to survive. <coughs> But it's not just fire that's an extension of my being. My clothing is also a form of technology which is part of me. Without clothing, humans would be far less able, without shoes, we would be far less able to travel across the lands to uh, endure harsh environments. My glasses are an extension of me, a cybernetic enhancement, without which I would not be able to see very well or at all, really. But with them, I can see. And note the use of the verb, I can see. My glasses don't show me things, I see. Similarly, if you touch my arm, you're not touching my sleeve, you're touching my arm. If I'm in the car and you rear-end me, you rear-end me. My body becomes extended by the artifacts around me. And it's represented in the way that we use language and talk about things. If I pull out my phone, I can talk to my father right now. 
I'm not saying words to my phone, which then gets translated into energy, which gets sent across the planet and makes his phone make noise. No, I'm talking to him. We have this conception that when we engage with technology, it's, it's not real life or something along those lines. But nothing could be further from the truth. We engage with each other through technology all the time. The technology that we use, our glasses, our shoes, our cars, our phones, our computers, these are extensions of us. There's no human alive who, if you drop them into the wilderness and you took away their tools, you took away their technologies, and you took away their ability to create technologies such as fire, there is no human, no matter how skilled or tough, that would be able to survive because fire because clothing, because all of these things are fundamentally necessary to what it is to be human. And this is right and good. We build a better world for ourselves when we create technology and we, we weave it into ourselves. But it's not to say that technology is a, uh, a perfect good. It's not to say that there are no problems with it, but that it fundamentally solves problems. We adopt it because it makes our world a better place, because it helps us reach towards light and goodness. And it's not just technology. It's also art. It's also culture. It's also our language. The human being is a creature that builds, that creates more, that works to overcome and to transcend. This is human nature. And when we combine these worldviews, the human being as a being about growth and about technology, and the world as not some sort of story that's handed from on high, not some sort of great plan or masterpiece, but rather of something closer to an accident of chance. These two things come together in my mind to form the philosophy of humanism. And I say humanism here, not transhumanism. Because in my mind, there is not a strong distinction between the two. I see transhumanism as being a take on humanism, a way of adopting a humanist paradigm that does not involve holding back. Let's go back to Dan. Dan is older now. Maybe he's middle-aged, okay? He's overweight. He's sometimes depressed, but he's happy in his work. He's trying to make the world a better place. And he has the humanist paradigm. He sees that he is responsible for making the world a beautiful place, not some power from on high, and that there are no rules that mean things have to be just or good. Let's say that one of Dan's partners, a good friend of many years, is depressed and ends up taking his life. There's no justice to be had there. There is no goodness. We can't console ourselves with comforting lies. And Dan mourns his death and thinks, if I had been there more, better, I could have prevented this. Maybe that's correct. Death is hard. It's wrong. It's bad. We fight against it. We seek to help other people have good lives, lives that are worth living. This is part of humanism. And to, from my perspective, it doesn't stop with someone who takes their own life because they're depressed. Death is bad. That's the simple way of living that leads to a transhumanist viewpoint. To say 
that the person who is 90 years old and who has frail and is dying of cancer, that person's life is also worth saving just as much as some starving child. That all of our lives are worth saving at every moment. And that there is not a point where nature is worth respecting. Natural deaths are not good just because they are natural. Our world is not fundamentally just. This is the perspective of someone who has not yet unlearned God. To say, this is not natural, therefore it is bad. Nature is brutal and dark. It is humanity that brings light. So, this is fine. We fight against death. But it's better than that. Because we have the capacity to grow beyond it. We are living in a new era, an era of technology which is far beyond what it was before. And there are fundamental breakthroughs that are occurring that have the promise to do things like extend life. I'm not going to go into details, but things like CRISPR and genetic modification have the promise to do things like cure HIV. Not just treat it, right? Dan could be free of this scourge. The whole planet could be free of this scourge. What's CRISPR? CRISPR is a genetic uh, tool that allows for the insertion of arbitrary DNA into people's cells. It's just a point that of one of many, a technological capacity which we have now, uh, which we've never had before. Once upon a time, smallpox was a scourge of the <clears throat> earth, and it's gone now. Human beings eradicated that disease. Malaria is going to follow. In the next couple decades, we will probably see the end of another terrible disease. There are no rules that say we cannot eradicate all disease. Disease is wrong. There's a humanist imperative to treat the sick and heal the injured. There's a transhumanist paradigm, uh, sorry, um, imperative that says that we must eradicate disease and make people's bodies immune to damage. That's hard, but it's possible. There are no rules that say that we cannot extend the human condition through new technologies. We can grow organs in labs today that can replace aging ones. There are new drugs and technologies that can do things like restore hearts to their elasticity that they have when we are young to prevent heart disease and heart attacks. <coughs> there are new technologies that can repair our bodies. We are working on these technologies. There's nothing impossible about that. We can imagine Dan being cured of HIV, but we can also imagine Dan being cured of obesity. There's an obesity epidemic in America right now as technology and wealth allows for the overconsumption of foods. And our bodies that were evolved in this ancestral environment on Af in Africa that are organized to suck up all the calories and hold them as fat. There's no reason why this has to be the case. The only thing that prevents us from doing it is the technological know-how. And there are fundamental technologies that could be developed that allow us to eat whatever we want and to have bodies that are healthy and young. There are technologies that can allow us to be muscled and fit without having to spend any exercise. There is a perspective, there's a paradigm that says, well, that's not right. That's not fair. Why should you just have the body that you want? Why should you not have to work for this? <coughs> but that's the point. There are no rules to this. There's nothing that says that we have to struggle or we have to <coughs> suffer. We can just make a better world. We're living in the better world right now. This world we have right he uh, here is, in many ways, the best time to live in all of human history. We are healthier now. We are more connected now. We are more knowledgeable now, literate, enlightened than we have been in the past. And yes, there's still darkness. There's still a long way to go. A lot of people are very foolish. 
there are a lot of disease, and there's a lot of death. Billions of people are suffering. Billions are in poverty. This does not have to be the case. We are building a new world through invention and growth and technology. A world that does not have to have a single person starving or impoverished without shelter. There's no, necess there's no necessity to that. There's no God that says, this is how it must be. There's nothing that says, oh, how dare you try. When did we stop telling good stories about the future? When did we turn from a point of optimism about the power of technology to a point of despair about how we was, were doomed and stuck and that we're on the brink of collapse? Which is not to say that we're not on the brink of collapse. <laughs> there are no rules. That means there are no safety rails. There's no <coughs> protection from on high. This is not a story that has a necessarily a happy ending. But it's also a story where the happy ending that we can imagine is a far greater one than anything that we can imagine uh, right now. We can point in that direction and we can say, think about Dan moving into late life, younger and freer, with more energy and vibrance and health than he had when he was younger. We can <clears throat> repair our eyes with lasers. We can repair our bodies with genetic uh, technologies, with synthetic technologies. We can repair our minds. There's nothing that says that depression has to be the state of affairs. There's nothing that says that we can't apply the scientific method to improving the human condition and finding enlightenment. There's nothing that says human beings cannot become angels. And in a certain way, I think that there's nothing more fundamental to the human condition than that, to seek out a better life in every moment. It is dangerous. Technology is dangerous. There are things to watch out for up ahead. And there is no edict that says that we are fundamentally safe. We have to be wise in our application and our search for the future. Like that first technology, we are playing with fire. But there is nothing above us holding us down or holding us back. The only risk comes from ourselves, from our absence of wisdom, and comes from the darkness of our environment, the way that the world is not fundamentally shaped to be fair or good. We have the capacity to overcome that. And that is the transhumanist paradigm. The paradigm that says that we as humanists do not just have to be uh, strident in making the world a better place for individuals, but the transhumanist paradigm says that we have something of a duty to make the human condition better. We have the opportunity to improve the world. There is nothing above us holding us back. There's nothing above us except room to grow.